So I'll briefly covered in the calculator video, I think it was video seven, uh, the use of enums, where I thought I'd take a, a deeper look and explain them a bit more in depth and then also show you a, a real world example of where we're now using them in the Facetta Word application. So I've just started a new console application and made a few notes of what we want to cover. So this is just a bog standard uh, .NET Core console app. You can make any, this is just for the purposes of the demo. So we're gonna get started with, um, first, what are enums? So by an enum, I mean, if we go here and do public enum, uh, my enums. And this is an enum. So an enum is just a keyword and it's a type. Um, and the point of um, an enum uh, is to store certain values. So the first point of what is an enum, an enum is a type like any other um, for the most part. So the same as, you know, an integer, a string, an object, they're all types in C sharp. So this is just another another type. If you think of it as like, you know, another style of uh, variable. Uh, that's the simplest way to try and uh, think of an enum uh, in terms of, you know, not technically what it is defined and how you explain it um, in terms of what it really is, but to understand it, just think of it as, as just like being another variable, like an integer. Uh, so this is all an enum is. An enum then contains values. So you can have my value one, uh, my value two, and so on. So now you can see you're starting to get a list. And this list is then a, a set of hard-coded constant values. We're typing them. They're not creatable at runtime. They are you know, defined at compile times. So, um, this sort of brings us on to, um, well, it doesn't quite bring us on yet to base type. So an enum is a constant list of values. And you can see when you hover over them, you're getting this one at zero and then one, and then if we add another one, it'll hover over. They're basically getting assigned an integer value by default. So if we then tried to get a value from this, so we'll say my enums and we have to pick one. So we'll pick value one and you can hover over A now um, and you can see that A is a variable A is assigned but never used. That's, so it's showing you that it's an enum of a type enum um, there. So basically we have a type of enum or in this case, a type of my enums. So this acts like the, the name integer. It becomes, this is the name of the enum. So you don't get an enum where you have, where you state, say if you did int i equals one, and this int here is the type. You can't type enum a equals my enums dot my value one. So you can't have a type enum, but you can have a type of the name of the enum. So the slight variation is this isn't the type, this becomes you know the name of the, the type of this enum. So slightly different than standard variables, um, but again, try to think of them as the same thing. So when you assign a value of the your specific enum to a variable, it's effectively the type of your enum. Um, now there's different base types. So as you can see here, what can you do with that value? Because right now it's a, you know, specific to this enum. So you can make use of that um, value. So for example, a classic place is in a switch statement, or let's just do an if for simplicity. So you'd say if a equals equals, and now you see you can compare them to, you know, set values. And you can do logic based on um, the type of value. Uh, also, when you come to store these values, say you store them in databases or code behind files, they can't be stored as an enum, because this is just a constant compiled type. So you either have to convert it to a string and physically save this name, or you convert it to the underlying base type. So an enum by default is an integer. And that's why these again auto assigned an integer value. So that means you could have var my int equals, and we'll just cast the value to an integer, or you could simply grab another enum and cast the value to an integer. And then if we were to run this example, we will see that my integer 
is equal to 1. And it's, it is an integer type as well. Um, so it's cast this enum to an integer. And that's by default. The, the underlying enum types are integers. And you rarely ever have to change them. Uh, but if you do, you can change them to, to basically any whole number type. So you could change them to, say, a byte, like that. And now we have a byte. And this will still cast fine, um, because, a, you know, they're all interchangeable. A byte can be cast to an integer. Uh, you can also have things like short, just, again, different and long, uh, different lengths of, you know, number values. So that's how you change the base type if you wanted to. Say you wanted to store some really long values. Uh, and you could say unsigned long or in C sharp rather, you long, uh, which stands for unsigned long. And it's a 64 bit integer. So now you can type a really, really, really long number. And in here, you can also assign specific values. So by default, you can see it gets zero, the next one gets one, the next one gets two. But you can go ahead and say, oh, this is going to be four, this is going to be five, it's going to be one. And now if we run this example, my value two, that was an integer, is now five. So again, another aspect of an enum, by default, the value goes zero, one, two, three, and adds up. If you start the value at two, and then you hover over the rest, you can see they then continue from two onwards. Uh, you can also say my value three equals my value two plus four. So you can also combine them as well. Um, which now that was two, that will be three, so that will be seven. Um, and that's how you add, you know, set the values. So usually I like to explicitly set values and I like to start at um, one. Now it is recommended that you also have a zero value. So you could say like uh, unknown is what I typically put as zero. So that's for if, and the reason I do that is by default an enum is an integer, and by default an integer, so if we do int equals default integer, you'll see that i will equal zero. So a default integer is zero. So if for any reason somebody creates an enum from an integer, or if, you know a default value anywhere comes into the system. I kind of catch that by the fact that it's unexpected. Um, whereas if we had my value one as zero, it could inadvertently be thought of as a valid value. So that's just a reason behind why I do zero as unknown typically, and then my value starting. I also explicitly state each one, so it's very clear glancing. When this list becomes 20 long, you can easily see the, the value of that um, name. So that moves us on to where to use them. So my value one, two, and three are not very useful. So one of the places we have used them, and that's in the Facetta Word application, is for animations. So we have a function. Let's just make a quick function. Uh, public static animate. And then we want to pass in. So let's rename this to animation direction. And we'll have left, right, up, down. And you can see now this is the why I've made this. So I want to animate something. We don't know what it is, but we expect a direction. So we pass it in just like another type of variable, like passing an integer in, you pass in the, the enum type of animation direction. Now in here, you could say if direction equals, equals left, console.writeLine, uh, animating left. And you could do an else if, uh, which is, you know, else of this. But the classic way to do enums is through your switch. So you'd simply switch on the direction. And then you do a case of left. And then you'd write animating. Oops. Animating left, like so. And you have right. I 
up, up and down, not top and bottom. <laughs> Left, right, up, down. And then you'd also want to handle the unknown case of default. So if it's anything else. And that's how you usually consume an enum. And also the point of um, the, make it a valid function. Uh, the point of why we've created this is because we have uh, a very set uh, requirement of, of values, a constant list, if you will. So we want to animate something in a certain direction. And we know there's only four directions we want to animate in. So we create a nice easy enum to be able to pass it in like a variable uh, and simply define very clearly what we want to do. So if we just change this now to something that will still work. And then we move on to where to use them, which is where I've used them here. So then we would do something like animate. And now you can see we can easily pass in an enum like this, and it's very clear looking at the statement then that we want to animate right. So now if we run, um, and we will also want to uncheck that and do uh, console.read. And that'll just stop the console from closing. And you can see now hello world and then animating right. So this is now catching and processing, and this is why we've used it to aid our function. So now we can make a universal function that will animate in all four directions and the caller can simply pass in, uh, you know, a specific animation direction. So this moves on to then casting to and from integers or to and from whatever base type, which is typically an integer. So as I mentioned before, if you store the value anywhere, then you end up storing, say you store it in a database, the value can't go in as an enum because a database doesn't know what an enum is. So it gets converted down to an int, which is something that a database does know. So if you ever save the value, pull it back in, or you you'd convert it to JSON maybe and send it over the internet, you'd typically want to convert it to, you know, its base type, not its string name. Because the other thing is, if you stored this value in a database, say this was a user signing up to your website, and this was a gender, and it was male, female, um, and you had this running, and you had 100 users, and then you realized you'd misspelled male, and it was spelled incorrectly. You could then rename the enum to you know something else. But the underlying value should stay as two. So then in your application and everywhere else, your value now updates to the correct name, but you haven't then just lost all of the backing values in the database or the stories. The, the value stays the same. So you always really want to store as the integer, not this name. This should really be used for developer purposes only for ease of visual, um, you know, a visual aid when passing values in. So firstly, we know how to get the value to an integer because we've quickly shown it here. So you can cast, uh, say this A, which is left, uh, you could cast it to an integer. So A as integer, and you just do this. You just simply cast it just like we've done here. So now we have the animation left as an integer. And then to cast it back uh, to an, an enum, so it will be uh, a uh, back as itself. And you'd simply cast the integer we have back to the animation direction enum. So that's it's just basically boxing and unboxing a value um, to a specific type. So if we ran this now and debugged, you can see that we have A, which is a left animation direction. A is an integer as one, which matches the value. And then A back as itself has converted back. So that's how you convert to and from integer values directly. When you have an integer, you've got a value. You can also create one directly. So var direct create equals, and then you could do animation direction of a value four. And you can see four should be down. So then if we run this, direct create should be an enum 
of down, which it is. So you can also instantate enums directly from numbers. Uh, the, the weird thing you can do as well without error is you can assign it to an enum that doesn't exist. So you can just do six and, and convert it to that type and it won't error. Um, and the, the weird thing is now, even though it's technically meant to be an integer, it just has the number six. So it's that's kind of a quirk of enums that you can you can cast an integer um, to an enum where the enum doesn't have that value and it will happily do that. So you have to be careful of that kind of creation. Don't presume this will fail if it's an invalid number. So let's put that back to a valid number. Now let's say for whatever reason you did um, want to use the string. Uh, the, like for example here, these whole animations, we could just say, get rid of all the switch and we will just output the enum value as a string. So we could do animating and then we just want to do direction dot to string. And you wouldn't have to do this to string inside here because it will automatically call dot to string, but that's what it's doing. So if we just passed in that now and animate in a certain direction and we run, it should say animating right because it should convert to uh, a string. So you see it says animating right. So now we have a string value, which we can also get here. So enum as name, if you will. And you could say, let's take in uh, that's my int, and oh, so that's the integer. Let's take in the a, which is left, and you just call a dot to string as you saw. And this enum of string now should have the string left. So you might need the name of the string for purposes of displaying to the console and things like that. And then you might want to get for whatever reason. I don't recommend doing this. This is like a last resort, or if for some reason you only have the string, not the value. You can try and get the enum back from that. And you can do uh, enum from string. And there's capital E this time. Enum.parse is a value. And this will try and parse the string that you're going to pass in back to a specific type. In our case, it's a type of animation direction. And the value is the enum is string. So enum as name, we've called it. And then if we run this, we should end up back with the original a value, which is the enum left. So that's how you cast back from a string to an enum. So a few warnings here, or a few quirks as well. Let's say we do this direct cast and it's of an unknown type, but we still have uh, an enum. And then we want to, or rather, let's just pass it straight in here. So instead of doing animation right, we do Animation direction six, and it's going to go in as an enum, and we're still going to get in here. We should now have animating six because it should still have turned to an enum. Uh, it's just now that the two six, the two string converted to the integer value. So again, one of those strange quirks with being able to create enums that don't have a backing value. In essence, you could think of it as if there is no value six, it's exactly the same as it appearing as if it was this, which is not valid because. Um, you, know, you can't start a, a variable with a number, but you can think of it like this. This is what it's similar to doing. So if you've you know tried to convert it to six and it doesn't exist, then C sharp is automatically saying, okay, we'll make an enum that's got the name six and the value six to you know allow it to work without crashing, if you will. Um, so that's one of the the quirks there. Uh, the other thing with this enum dot this is a crashable um, call. So you can see exceptions there, argument null, argument exception, and overflow. So they can be thrown based on what you pass in. So if we passed in null, then we should get argument null thrown. We just have to control alt and E and turn on the second one down to catch the exceptions. And if we run this, it should crash with argument null, which it does. Uh, so you've got to be aware that that might fail. We can also pass in a, an unknown name, and that should fail with the invalid argument exception or rather argument exception on its own. Uh, so those two things can crash. Uh, the overflow, um, I'm not sure where it ends up falling into causing that, but it can obviously throw that as well. 
so how you should either handle this is if you're expecting that, then you could do a try and you could catch explicitly the argument exception. Uh, and I think there's a new C sharp seven, uh, something like catch where. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but you'd, you'd just do catch argument exception, say. And you could handle argument exception. You could do catch uh, argument null exception, and you could handle it that way. Uh, oh, it wasn't argument null, was it? It was, uh, yeah, there was a null, null reference exception. Uh, so you could handle these two exceptions that this is expecting to throw, and also overflow, and then do something specific. Or an easier way, instead of having to try catch the whole thing, is you can just change this enum parse to an enum try parse. And now it won't crash, and what it'll do instead is return a boolean if it was successful. So now you change your logic from enum from string, that becomes the uh, variable output here, which we can now do out uh, animation direction and cannot convert from type to string. Okay, so now the try parse takes in the type as a generic instead of a, a type. And then the value is the enum name and the variable is passed as an out and outputs there. So now you flip the logic. So if we just copy that line and undo so you can see the differences. So that's one way of doing it, and that's the other way of doing it. And that will you know, result in, this one will crash if it doesn't exist. This one will return true or false, whether it works or not. So then your logic would be if, and you'd wrap that. So now if it succeeds, we'll get into here. I'm going to do console.writeline successfully converted to, and then we could output the value as well. And that value is enum from string. So she can get cast back to a string anyway. Else console dot right line failed to convert. And then we'll pass the value again anyway. And it was enum as name was the thing we were trying to convert. So if we run this. We should see that it successfully converts, and there you go, successfully converted to left. But then if we were to change this to something invalid, and we were trying to convert, it won't crash now, but instead it'll go to the boolean that says it's failed to convert something invalid. So that's, that's two ways of processing from strings. You can either do a direct enum.parse and, and try catch the error, or you can do a try parse and then do the logic based on whether it worked or not. Uh, but again, I'd avoid doing string parsing as much as possible, uh, wherever you can. Uh, right, enumerating the enum. So an enumerator, uh, by definition, uh, you've also got this in C sharp and in just the English language in general, but an enumerator is something that you, you enumerate through. So basically you, you step through one at a time and you evaluate and then you continue. Um, so again, that, that's kind of a list, if you will. Uh, but a list is something in programming terms that is already completely defined and in memory. Uh, so everything exists there. Whereas an enumerator, uh, you, you don't process each item um, until you step into it. So in terms of a database call, if you're enumerating a result from a database that says get all users, and there's a million users, an enumerator won't get a million users from the database. It will get the first one. And then when you go to the next one, it will ask the database for the next record. And you step over one at a time. Whereas a list would have pulled in the million users and then you simply iterate through that in code. So an enumerator, or when you talk, you see enumeration, um, or I enumerable, uh, which is a type in the collections. This isn't an enum. Don't get these two things confused. An enum is the type that we're talking about here, which is a list, but it's a static, you know, a constant list that we've defined. But it's not in any way related to an I enumerable. It, it's simply, um, well, I say it doesn't, it's, you know, it's got similarities. It's a list and it's a constant and we can 
you know, get the, the list of items, but it's not anything related to this I enumerable. So when we say let's enumerate over the enum, we mean let's, you know, say we have this type now and we want to do some, we want to find out what the, all these types are. We want to provide some user interface for the user to select a direction. And then based on that, we'll do some animation. So how do you then present these items to the user? Or how do you get those items in the first place in general? So you can enumerate them in terms of getting all the items with the capital enum, which is the helper class for working with enums. And you can do get names and get values. So get values will get you all the enum values uh, of a specific type. So again, type of animation direction. So then with, no, nope, that's not the type. Uh, so get values. So now you can do a for each var val in the enums console.writeLine, and let's just output the value. So this will enumerate all of the, uh, not closed off enough. This will evaluate all of the values in here, which will be unknown left, right, up and down, and it'll output them to the console. So you can see that's enumerated all of the values. And if you put a breakpoint here, you could actually see each value as you go through. So this is getting the actual enum value. The same as like here where we, you know, create it. Same as this variable. It's a, it's of this type of enum, but this will get each one. So you can step through and do what you like. Uh, you could then use uh, the same thing again, but you could say get names. And then that will output. Uh, and the, the only difference here is it's, it's simply got value and called dot to string on it by, you know, by default. So this will have no difference in our loop here. But well, that's based on whether you want, uh, you can see now it's a string, so you can see the double quotes around it, as opposed to it being, you know, the actual enum. So you've got those two options to get name or value. And then you might have seen as well, you have enum.getName. And then this type of uh, animation direction, and then the value. So we have, um, a value, say, this left one, so let's pass in A, and call it B, really creative name. And if we run this, B will have the string name of the enum, which is left. So really, uh, there might be some underlying um, reason to do this, as opposed, um, yeah, A dot to string. And I guess the only reason I can see there is it will potentially do, well, in fact, it's not, it's, it's going to throw a null anyway if it's null. So to be honest, I don't see any point in an enum.getName when, you know, the enum itself dot to string will do exactly the same thing. Um, at first I thought, well, if that was null, then it would, you know, handle that and return a blank string, but it doesn't, it throws argument null. So that's no different than if we were to call, you know, a dot to string and a was null, it would still then, do the same thing. So there's enum not get name, but I've never used it. I just use to string as needed. Um, if anyone knows of a reason or a difference to this, then calling dot to string, let me know, but I'm unaware of any, uh, but it's there for your knowledge. So that's the enumerating through the string, uh, enumerating through the enums and getting the values or the strings. And then finally, we really have flags. So another use of um, a constant enum list is usually for say options. So a classic place for this is if you go file.open and you have file mode. And you see this file mode has append create. Uh, okay, that was actually a bad, bad example. Um, I don't think that's the one I was thinking of, no. There's an option somewhere. Um, let me see if I can remember where it's basically a set of um, open read, I think, or is it an open? It's just the overload file access, maybe. So was it file access read? No, they've done it read, right? Okay. So I will try and think and maybe post in the comment what I'm thinking of, but you can use, um, enums as like a set of options, a flag of 
you know, various options that can be set um, in one go. So you could have a public enum my options. Um, and let's say we want to uh, give the user the ability to, uh, let's try and think of a good example here. It's real world example. Uh, we'd have, you can have, um, I mean, this isn't a great example, but you'll get the gist of what I'm doing here. Uh, you have the, I know what's a good example. Say you have a user system um, and you want permissions. So user permissions, and it's a very specific set of permissions here. So we have, say, a blog site, and we want a user to be able to uh, have various options. So one would be to read, one would be to write uh, blogs, uh, one would be to delete blogs, one would be to create users. And you can see the, the gist of what we're doing there. These are options that a user might have, but they could, they could have the ability to read and delete and not write, or they could have all four options. Uh, and you want to combine these. You don't want, you know, multiple flags. You don't want a Boolean for this, a Boolean for this, a Boolean for this, a Boolean for this. You can just simply have a single value uh, that can have multiple options set. So in order to, to do that, uh, I've made a video on bitwise operators and, and how bits work in terms of setting the, you know, the bits. So if I did a calculator and I went to programmer, and when I say bits, say the number four, and you go to binary here, you can see zero, zero, one, zero. So these are the bits here. And I won't go in depth because I've done a video on this, but when you're setting bits, you can set you know, this bit, this bit, this bit, and a bit is simply on or off. So if we've got four options here, we only need four bits in memory to define each of these options. So this could be the read bit, this could be the write, uh, this could be the delete and this could be the create. And you can see the, the decimal value here is eight. So if we were to turn on all values, then the decimal is 15. So if we wanted to enable every option in here, we'd expect you know an integer of 15. So how do we represent that here? Well, the simple thing is, you want to, this number read to be one. You want the write to be two. You want the delete to be four, you want the create to be eight. So all it's doing is doubling the number. So in order to store all the values, you have one, two, four, eight. The next one would be 16. And you can go back to calculator to see that. So if you kept going up, you'd have 16. You see it there, you, know, you see the decimal. Uh, so 16, 32, 64, one, two, eight. But you don't really want to write it that way. There's an, an easier way to, to do this and to remember these values. So as you get larger and larger, you'll be going 32, uh, 64, 1, 2, 8, 2, 5, 6, and you, you have to keep doubling your number. So instead of writing a, an integer decimal, you can just do OX1, which is you know hexadecimal. Uh, and hexadecimal, again, I've done videos on these, so I won't go too much into depth. But you do your hex value, which as you'll notice here, one, two, four, eight. And then you'll notice you go to the next set of four, uh, which I think is called a nibble when it's the, the four. Uh, you'll see then it basically puts a zero and then it's one, two, four, eight. You go to the next one, one, two, four, eight. So you see what's happening here. Now in order to define the values correctly, all you have to remember is that you use one, two, four, and eight, and once you've run out, you, you put a zero on, and you carry on. And that will naturally then define um, an enum where all these can be combined with an or operation to set the flag. And by set the flag, I mean set the bit. So now if we want to define user permissions that are, say, read and delete, then we do it by going to here uh, and do permissions equals user permissions dot read. And then we use this pipe, which is the or pipe, which combines them. So it means the, the value of this or this, and then combine them up. So if either of them are set, 
then the result includes that bit. So because the read blog has this bit set and the create blog has this bit set and the all means, you know, that value, all that value are set. So this, all this are set. The result is effectively like adding them together. So even though it's an all, you can think of this as sort of an addition, if you will, an add. So we want to do a read blog and a create blog. And if we run that now, you should see that we have, we should have one plus four. So we should have an integer of five now, or rather nine, uh, because it's the hexadecimal four. Um, so if you go to, uh, in fact, no, that's, no, I'm going to say that should have been right. What we've done is the read and create. Uh, the read is one, the create's eight, sorry, not delete. So we've got eight plus one, which is the nine. So you have an integer value of nine. So that is now a single integer of a value nine, but because the way we've constructed this with always doubling the value, it means nine can only ever match these two values. So there's nothing else this could ever combine to. So we know that the, you know, the user permissions we can extract these two values from. So it's a good way of compacting and storing permissions and, or any other values in a single uh, variable. So then to read that out, there's also a thing, if you're ever doing this kind of enum where it's what are called flags, so we're indicating that this is a set of options, you should add the attribute at the top that says flags. And that's a helper um, for certain things. And one of the things that'll help is the console.write. So if we now did console.write and we passed in permissions and we run this, it should output the permissions and you can see there read blogs create users so it's actually figured out for us that we have passed in these two options so you could simply state this is reading from an integer and let's say we want it to be b delete and write so that would be two plus four is six plus the two uh, which if we go back to the calculator if you don't know go to hex type 2o so 2 into hex is 32 in decimal. So you've got 32 plus, uh, we get say delete and read, didn't we? So 32 plus 5 more. And that will give us read, delete, and the letter B. So we want 37 as the value. So we just literally create a user permission from the integer 37, and then we output it to the console. We can see it knows it's read, delete, and B. So that's kind of a, a concept that you'll have to understand initially, um, bitwise operators and or, oring values together, um, which I've covered in the previous videos. Uh, and then you can understand that all we're doing here is going to a calculator, seeing the, the binary values, and we're basically using each bit of the, the integer to store a value to represent one of these. So every time we add a new option, we jump down in this order and we keep jumping down. So each bit in the integer will represent one of these options. And now we can turn on any combination of these options and simply use a single user permission. So hopefully that's clear enough that you understand really everything about enums. So there's nothing more about enums than, than really isn't covered here. Um, and again, the, the main thing is the use case, which is, is usually and most typically things like this where you, you want to pass in a set option like a, an animate a certain direction. Um, the alternate option is when you're storing, you know, flags, permissions or things that have multiple options. And again, you don't want a, a class with a bunch of Booleans in. Um, you want to, you know, user permissions. Uh, then the other thing with that is say you've created this um, enum with user permissions here. And you now want to say, well, in your logic, we've said this, this has got permissions of read, delete, and B. But in your code, what if you want to say, well, if the user's got the ability to delete, allow them to, or rather, if they haven't, don't let them. So to do that, you'd say if uh, permissions, and you'd say if permissions and, so this is basically how you say if permissions, if they've got permission for delete, you'd say if permission and user permission delete, equals delete, then you'd do something. So you'd have to wrap that up 
and then that's how you do it. So this logic, and again, if you understand bitwise operators, this means all the permissions you've been given, which includes delete, and the delete has the bit set. So the delete bit only has the fourth bit set, sorry, the third bit set. So the delete bit only has this bit. So if we did delete and, and then regardless of what's in here outside of this bit, because this one only has this bit set, all the others are going to get wiped out. So even though this has got the read bit set and the B bit set, which is somewhere here, because this one doesn't, and we've anded them together, these two naturally get removed. And this one only stays flagged, if you will. This one only stays set if this has the, the delete bit set as well. So this, again, I'm sure I covered this in a previous video, uh, but this is how you do effectively checking of permissions has the delete blog set. Um, so that's the check if it's set. And then if it is, you do console.writeline. I can delete. So if we run that now, we should see that we can delete. So I can delete. And now if we were to remove the delete, which is knocking four off the value. So if we, that was 33. We can now see the read blogs and bees there, but delete permissions gone. And we also don't output delete permission. So that's how you obviously read back in, uh, you know, an enum to see if it contains a specific one as well. So I think that's everything covered in enums. Uh, any questions, let me know. Again, comment on the video and I'll reply. But hopefully this was a, a more in-depth tutorial on fully understanding everything about enums. Uh, there isn't really much to them, but there's a couple of concepts that you need to understand. And hopefully they've all been covered here.